to the next generation of agricultural leaders uh, prepared for these demands on agricultural system. You know, think about each of the, the students that you, you let them graduate from your class. Everyone should have some leadership skill, and everyone should be able to contribute to that. Can we sustain the educational institutions? Then we prepare leaders for tomorrow. So the role of agricultural institutions such as the Assam Agricultural University, you will have to transform higher education goals for evolving global food and agricultural enterprises. You know, with the problems are the problem that you have in uh, in Assam is not Assam's problem anymore. It's the problem of the world. The problem that you have it in Bangladesh, that's not Bangladesh's problem, that's probably Assam's problem too. And the effort by higher education should, you know, they should shape academic focus around real issues. No more theories. Well, we need theories, but you know, you need to connect those theories with the real world problem. What's happening out there? That's how the students can motivate. And, you know, the refashion by way, knowledge of complex system is fostered. You have to talk about the whole system. Let's say students in your soils class or in economics class, they should be able to look at the whole, you know, supply chain out there. And you probably know that the buzzword they talk about farm to fork, right? You all know that kind of thing. So students should be able to see the whole whole system out there. So you know your workforce that you're going to produce, they will have scientists, seed suppliers, business managers, economists, crop insurers, bankers, food chemists, uh, energy producers, packaging engineers, food safety, quality control expert, ecologists. Veterinarian, meat inspector, risk assessors, and and so on, so forth. They must be, be like they means the educational institutions. They must bridge the disciplines, language gaps, physical distances, and national differences to achieve goal. One thing that I think you know, you all have to agree. The one thing you know, India has very uh, good human resources. Our students and including you all are very good in analytical. Uh, thinking power. The one thing is lacking is multidisciplinary research. People just don't talk to each other. You know, if you're a soil scientist, you work with soil. If you are a food scientist, you work with food. You never work with the, the product that you are developing, how it's going to uh, go to the market. You never discuss with the economics and things like that. So our, we kind of produce very narrow vision students out there. So once you kind of do that, your, your curriculum you develop like that, your students will feel in the same way. Okay, this is the greater effort is needed to take on the responsibility for providing focus and preparing students for various agricultural related disciplines or enterprises. Sorry, you have to think about what are the businesses out there that our students will go. And you know, there will be more and more demands for agriculture. Why undergraduate education in agriculture must change? And you know, we don't have, you don't have to see the slide. You already know. Why do we have to change that? Because we have to make the connection from our classroom to the real world. So you all, as a faculty member, should take some responsibilities of you know, strategic planning. You know, make sure that your voice is heard. You, you make sure that, you know, uh, the way you want to shape up the student, each and every one of you should be able to contribute. Involve faculty in and outside agriculture, alumni, disciplinary societies, commodity, and undergraduate student experience should integrate opportunities to develop a variety of transferable skills, including communication, teamwork, management, participate in undergraduate research. Do your students participate in research, undergraduates? never do that because we underestimate them. You bring the best of the best students. You know, those students work very hard. They have very good skill, but we never do that. What does that do? You know, I'm a big proponent of undergraduate research. So far, I have about 95 undergraduate students did research with me, and they are the best students that you can recruit for your graduate work. Because you don't have to teach them. They already know. The day they start their master's or PhD program, you know, they perform at the same level like your other PhD students are doing. So, you know, bring some of the undergraduate students. And you know, it's not that difficult to identify them because they, you know, you ask in your classroom, you already know which are the students that are little. Your students also need to participate in outreach and extension. 
This one, we don't even let, in India, we don't even let graduate students participate. They, the students need to participate in internships and other programs that provide experience beyond the institutions. I remember when I was an undergraduate student, we never had internship. Every summer I come home. And you know, because I went out there, you know, my mother was you know very happy to have me home. So we just eat, drink, and sleep. That's all we do. Now back there in Illinois or in any other even I think this thing has started. You look at the all IITs. I on a daily, you know, daily I get uh, requests from undergraduate students from all the IITs. Can I come and work in your lab in the US? For, for three months or summer, one month or two months. You should also promote your students to, to go and work. So, uh, and exposure to international perspective, including targeted learning uh, abroad programs. These ones, I don't know, but you know, IITs have started doing that. All the private universities do that. You know, my former advisor from Iowa, he is now the Vice Chancellor of what is called LPU, Lovely Professional University or something. Uh, in, in, in Jalandhar, so I was there, and they are now promoting all their uh, undergraduate students to go, you know, anywhere. It doesn't have to go to the U.S. They can simply go to Thailand and work there. They can go to Bangladesh. They can work there nearby. Or it's, they can go to Nepal. And you know, yesterday I had a meeting with the president of there is another big university called Amity, A M I T Y. You know, now they want to collaborate with me, and you know. Students are asking if I want to come and, and teach some of this their program. So you know, you all need to think about how best you can do for your students. This is just an example for engineering, you know, right? We teach it. So our programs are evaluated every five years. We have to be accredited, and I think you also have similar program through ICR and all that kind of thing. So you know, they and, and we list there about ten qualities that the students should have. The first three are in engineering, we have engineering science fundamentals, then the basic engineering classes, and the context in which engineering is practiced is like a capstone course or something like that. In your discipline, you know the base. What the, this is called core competence. So your student, let's say your student graduate from horticulture, what you want them to know. The rest, these are becoming more and more important these days. Your student should be able to have communication skill and is proven before they graduate you must know that they know how to communicate both writing and, 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 and oral communication you know nowadays students are sitting in the writing skill you know how they write in the internet you know in the emails and all don't excuse them for not writing grammatically correct English otherwise who is going to teach them so you know teamwork they should be able to work in teams you know, just, just working in a lab is not, not enough if you don't really design. Uh, team, it, the students, many times, you know, uh, you were a student one day, you probably know, many times you learn more from the person sitting next to you than from the professor. Let's call it a peer learning. You learn from each other. And when students work in team, you know, they learn a lot from each other. So let them work in team. Students should be very flexible. They should be very flexible, you know? If, 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 if one of your undergraduate student tells, this is what I want to be. I see myself 10 years from now, that's the position. I want to be the, the chief of the bank, that, you know, some government bank or whatever it is. Tell them, you know, they need to be flexible. There are other opportunities to so probably be there and don't let them pass their opportunity. Curiosity and desire to learn. You know, lifelong learning is, is that's how people become, you know, they always stay uh, up on with their new knowledge and new things out there. Commitment to quality, timeliness, and continuous improvement. These two kind of go uh, together. So, you know, you have, not that you have, you don't have, you don't have much time, not that you will just finish your homework or something. Make sure that you deliver a quality. Professionalism, we all know. Right, because we have to be professional, you know, you have to present yourself, you have to stick by the rules. And to, but what do you mean by, by being ethical? What's right and wrong? But what's right and wrong to you may not be right and wrong to her. So how do we decide that? Social responsibility. Social responsibility. 
and how you value That's it. You know, those, those, all of them are right or, you know, right or wrong. The value, the social responsibility, what you feel in your heart, that that's the right thing to do. You think we teach our students to do that? Where did they learn that? They learn from the father and mother. And if they have grandparents. But, you know, those who do not have, where would they learn? The students that will come from uh, come from orphanage, maybe, where would they learn? You think the schools teach it? <coughs> our, our, our schools teach them to be very competitive. You know, I know. Our students, high school students in India are so stressed out. You think they have time to think wrong and right? All they have to get an A and 90% and then get admission in good school. That's all they think about. And the parents, they give up everything, you know, they are, you know, they, they spend all their time and so much pressure on the students. So, you know, these are some of the traditional methods that we all do, I do, you do. Uh, lecture, lab, homework. And, you know, we said, do the students really learn? Do students develop mastery of the fundamental concepts by this lecturing, you know, this, this monologue that you are talking and they are listening? Or can they solve the real world problem from those kind of things? So research shows that students learn no more than 30% of the key concepts that they did not already know at the start of the class. This is, this is research. I'm not talking about that. So the traditional methods are, you know, they're not bad, but I think there are other methods that have been proved to be more effective. Or, you know, linking learning theories like the cognitive science to your practice that you do in your class, bringing real world perspective to the classroom, reducing cognitive loads, that's what I'm talking about. Too much content. Too much content. You know, if you have too much content on the student's mind, they don't feel the freedom. They don't, they don't have time to innovate. They don't die, have time to go deep and uh, feel the joy of innovation. And also, you know, the stimulating and guiding students' thinking. Uh, you know, these are these are some new approaches, and of course, using technology. And you know, right now I have seen and I have visited many of the agricultural universities in India. All they think technology is PowerPoint. That's all they think. You know, that's that's not technology. There are other, but there are people that know. You know, they you know in my the eye clickers are invented by by one of my colleagues. Uh, University of Illinois. You know what I'm talking about? Have you seen eye clickers? Like, you know, what is, are your classes large or small? How many students? Huh? More than 100. 164 in one class. Two sections. Okay, let's, so part session, let's say about 80. Is that the maximum you have? More than 80. Yeah. So, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to connect with all the students. I mean, it's, you have to be a superhuman being to do that. You can't do that. So how do you assess during your class, class classes if the students, you cannot ask, you can ask questions only to few of them. You cannot ask all of them. So how do you assess that whether they are learning or are they the mastery of the topic? And, and so, you know, it's, it's not that easy. That's why all the, there are many different, the eye clickers are in every student. Now, my son is a freshman in engineering this time. So, the time when he enrolled for the classes, they charge him because the university give him an eye clicker. So, he has to take it to his class. What it is, it's simply like a, like a remote, like the, the TV remote, you know. So, you take that and there is a number and that's your number. And, and the professors will have uh, in the, in the, in the, in the front of the class, they have a little box, like those cable boxes, something like that, you all know what I'm talking about. And then they, when, you, you can have multiple answers, A, B, C, D, or, or things like that. So after, let's say, the professor taught a class, and then he gives a quiz or a homework, and say, so, okay, here is this thing, and, and now the answers are multiple choice, A, B, C, D. And, and how many of you, uh, uh, so you, so everybody puts their answer. And then you, you automatically see that. In the corner, you automatically see that. You have 80 students, okay, 30 said C, 20 said B, 
and say A and, and so on. So you get, you see, you know, if the answer is B and 30 of the students say it's A, you know that you did not do a good job. Means you are, what the way you are talking, you are engaged with their minds. You know, they are listening, they are paying attention to you. They start becoming critical thinkers. They will start thinking. I mean, what's critical thinking? What's critical thinking? When I say, you know, my students are really critical thinkers. Listen. That means they are thinking about the things that they are doing. It's not doing their lab and, you know, the lab, standard lab methods. Yeah, you just follow the methods and then they do it. But are they thinking about what they're doing? That's called critical thinking, right? Because they, 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 they understand what's the uh, shortcomings, what's the best thing, how they can improve on those kind of things, which is a higher order of thinking. They relate those contexts to real world scenario. So whenever the student is uh, uh, learning from you, you know, whatever class, whether you're solving an a, you know, a, a economic problem or solving a food science problem, the students, you know, they will be thinking, oh, you know, this is how the things are happening in the real world. So that connection will start coming and they become, you know, the problem solver. Engaging students in active learning and effective questioning. And I'm sure you know, you know the active learning means the students are active with you, with the content, and with each other. So that's, that's a very active learning, uh, that's the essence of active learning. You know, the students are engaged. So basically, you know, the, 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 the reason for this uh, active learning, we have the teacher, the student, and the convent, these are very much integrated. You know, they are all active, you know, both the, the teacher, students, teacher and convent, and student and convent. And that puts the pressure on the teacher. If you really don't know the subject, don't go and teach it. So, you know, the difference between active learning and, and you know, active learning, you, you do that, so I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, active learning and passive learning. So here, you only, the students only receive information uh, from whatever you're, you're giving them. In active learning, the student experience those information. They can relate those. They reflect and then they have a reflective dialogue with them. You are giving them time, like, you know, you're giving them one or two minutes break to think about other things, then students do something. They you know, either maybe give them a quiz or something. They do it. They do it either themselves or they do it other, or they just observe someone else do it. So that that th those are the characteristics of the active learning uh, thing. So yeah. So most common way of engagement, you know, here is a slide. What what does this slide mean to you? Are they actively learning? No. So I think you one of you said you ask them questions. That's a very powerful tool. That's a very powerful tool. So questioning is a first one. So the effective questions could be described as single most influential teaching act because of the power of questions to impact students' thinking and learning. And I think Tava's book has a lot more than that. But we don't have to go into detail, you already know that. So, uh, for large classes, research indicates that teachers talk about academic content, accounts for what percent of the, you know, in the large class, they get 80 percent. How much time do you talk of the class time? How much time do you give them silence? And how much time students talk? True, and you all said that true. Number two, in active learning, there is more emphasis on transmitting information and less on developing student skills. That's false. That's false. Students lose their initial. This is true, right? Yes. We all know. And regarding the content, more is better. We know it's false. Here are things you know: listening, talking, writing, reading, reflecting, doing, touching, smelling, testing. These are very, but I was reading this new book. They're kind of uh, 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 smelling and tasting. They're kind of not putting emphasis on much of that. Okay, uh, team learning and cooperative learning. That's enough. So first one is active learning. 
and then in teamwork and the cooperative learning, and I explain a little bit about how you know uh, the teams. If you learn, you know, many times it's actually good for you also. Let's say you are busy many times. Sometimes we all have you know some kind of circumstances that we are not ready to teach the class, and you know maybe you traveling or something. You should. Uh, have some strategies so the students can work. In every of one of your class, you know, you don't need the permission of the, your dean or department to do this kind of thing. So you can have those teamwork, you, can, you have that. And you know, you go to the classes and today we are just going to do a teamwork. When our students go out in the real world, they know that they have to work with others. You know, if you are an engineer, you're a scientist, you have to work somebody for the human resources. You have to work somebody you know the political science background, those who know the laws and things like that. So you know, so that's, that by by exposing to the teamwork, you make that happen. Face to face interaction, we all know, right? That's the great thing. And and, and you know, I, I I am not very favorable in terms of this online education thing out there. Even if you do a team, you still should have individual accountability. Because every person, otherwise, many times, and I have that experience myself, if I go to design a teamwork, only one or two person in the team. If five people are doing a problem, only one or two students will do that. Others are just singing or texting or doing something because they know he or she in that team, they are going to do that. So don't let that happen. That means if your, your purpose will be fail. And then, you know, you should have the group self assessment. When the team do a project, whether it's a time project, group pay, paper project, or whatever you want to do that, make sure that you know, they evaluate each other. Confidential, of course. And then, you know, and, and I do that, and we are, we are required to do that in our, our classes. And of course, then they start developing the interpersonal skill, communicating, respecting to each other, listening to some, you know? In, in, in many times, we just like to talk. Listening is an art. How to listen so the students will learn right from in your classroom. So the inquiry-based learning, and you know, we did a research on that one as part of my distributed scholar program. You know, how can you have this inquiry-based learning strategies in everyday class, every class that you do? It prepares your students with complex problem solving skills. And then you know this slides back to the very first. Our second slide that I showed after Carl Wyman that in the modern economy is largely based on those kind of things. And so we need to produce citizens with complex problem solving skills. Like so. so here are, this is the inquiry process. And if you go to, there is a, a website at the University of www.inquiry.uic.edu, you'll be able to get that. There are a lot of papers and, and theories out there. What it is, and this is nothing new to you. Those of you that have done uh, graduate school or PhD or masters and have guided graduate students, you already know that. So here, you know, in the inquiry based learning, people construct knowledge based on the questions that arise in their lived experience. Now think about the research project that your PhD student are working. Research objectives here they ask questions, right? Every project you have a title and then the objectives. By the end of this three year, I'm going to answer objective one, objective two, objective three, and then they investigate methods and materials. This goes very well with the way we write our pieces. And then, you know, after they investigate, they, they, they get results, you know, either from field work or computer modeling or market survey or whatever, they create the results and they have the discussion results and discussion section. Sometimes you probably don't have that in many of the, uh, the thesis, the reflection. Our students are so, you know, I should let me, let me revise the center and discuss it, and then immediately the time comes for the defense exam. So they don't have time to reflect. What I did, I mean, we have, we call it recommendation at the end, you know, say, well, I could not do it for my research, but here is what I recommend for the future people do that. But I think they need to do it on themselves. Everybody needs to reflect. And then, you know, you ask another question. So, you know, we, we suggested that instead of a cycle, we should go on a spiral. 
you ask a question, you investigate, you create knowledge, you discuss, then you reflect. And based on your reflection, your question will be a different question that you'll ask. Now, if we do that for graduate students, why cannot we do that for our undergraduates? In every class, you can design your class. At the beginning, you tell, you know, you know what are you going to do when you go to your class? What are you going to tell them? What core competencies they are going to develop in your class? And then how you do that? And, and, and then you assess you know, how they have learned. Then discuss, let the students reflect on themselves. So, you know, and, and, and if I had more time, I could have explained some of the examples that, that we have done in many of the undergraduate classes and, and courses. If you go to this website, you'll be able to see one. So you know, inquiry-based learning is coming, and I'm sure some of you probably do that anyway. So it's, it's a very new, innovative method for uh, the students learn a lot. You know, they start thinking at a very higher level, you know, from, you know, they go to the metacognition level up there. Next one, please. So, you know, yeah, here are the things. Why? Because the high-level skills in the students can, you know, develop more skills in communication. They, their computation level goes high, and this is, uh, you know, some of the engineering classes or other technical. The technological literacy, literacy and your information retrieval uh, expertise that they develop, they think at a higher order, their critical thinking abilities go high, they are able to arrive at an informed judgment, you know, because if they, if they, if they critically look at something and, you know, is that the right thing? Because when they reflect, they would be able to come with the, you know, very well informed. Ability to function in a global community, they become ethical, open-minded, self-starter, they become civil, respectful, resourceful, bunch and bunch of things are there. And I'm leaving this presentation with you, and you know, Shuesh, you can give it to them, you know, they can make it happen. So, you know, if you do this kind of thing, there, are, there will be change in your roles, expectations, and assumptions. Our students become independent problem solver, and but they yet work in a group environment. They they wrestle with ambiguity and uncertainty, which you know are in the Indian education system we don't have that much. Now, if you do those inquiry based learning kind of thing, you know it, it, it serves the teacher will become just like a facilitator. You know we don't serve as an expert that the students develop their own knowledge. We move away from the covering the content. We become creative in identifying appropriate and effective problems. That's very important. You know, if you really design it, good. And you prepare your students to take on this active, innovative ways of learning. The students feel the joy of innovation. Next one. You know, and all those things, many of these things you know that you know these are all NBD twenty based learning, service learning, and you know your Maui program that your experiential learning program that you do that, you know, undergraduate research, independent study, you know, you can have your students do independent study for your project uh, or, or order to industry or something. I don't know if you have capstone project. Do you have capstone? You know what that is? In our in the US university system, on the final year, the students have a, we call it a capstone course. The students don't learn any new content. Like first year, second year, third year, they go through all these classes, like many different technical, non-technical, um, and, and other classes. So, comprehensive. Comprehensive. Comprehensive exam. And there's a Bible exam. Bible exam. We ask so many people. They answer. They show the video also. Very good, very good. I'm, I'm glad that you know you guys are doing that kind of thing because everything they do and if you if you do that assessment, then they feel they have a sense of responsibility. And and you are helping them fulfill that. Should let's go to the next one or should we stop it here? I don't mind, I can go on.